Next, we have Catherine Hills from Cambridge, and she'll be talking about the dynamics of inwards course on education and asteroids and insights from animal perspectives. Hi, thanks for all being here today. Um, so I've just finished my PhD before Christmas, and what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is kind of the last sort of major project from that. And that is these analog experiments we did up in the maths department, actually trying to look at some of the key physics behind inwards core solidification in asteroids. So that's a little video going, a few more of those. So very much the background behind this and the sort of motivation for this work um, is uh, the meteorite paleomagnetic record we've now got that shows um, across a variety of different meteorite groups that from sort of 65 to 200 million years after the start of the solar system, these asteroid sized bodies were capable of generating a dynamo field um, during crystallization of their core. Um, as sort of Hannah was talking about earlier. So there were those sort of late dynamos she was showing in her time plots. Um, however, so sort of given their small size, it's quite likely these cores crystallize inwardly instead of outwardly, like they do in the Earth's core does, so we're looking at quite a different type of dynamo mechanism to the geodynamo. Um, and so these are a couple of sort of proposed mechanisms of dynamo generation for these sort of small planetary bodies where we're expecting crystallization to proceed from the core mantle boundary inwards. Uh, so on the left, no, that's the other one. <laughs> on the right, um, this is sort of the sketch of Ganymede, so you've got a mantle up top, um, and in Ganymede we have this idea of this iron snow, which um, Rook Riemann et al. came up with in 2015, where the iron crystals form at C and B, they fall, and as they fall they actually move into the interior, which is now hotter due to the adiabatic heating, remelt, and then this dense pure iron um, sort of mixes in with this sort of less dense iron iron sulfur interior, generates convection and that convection is powerful enough to actually drive the present day dynamo we see in Ganymede. And then on the left, we've got this slightly different model um, developed by Jerome Neufeld in 2019 um, to try and explain the um, magnetization of the four meteorites, which are these quickly cooled uh, meteorites that maybe came from Psyche, this potentially metal meteorite. And in this case, you've actually you've not got a mantle at this point, you've just got this sort of frozen, almost kind of fusion crust um, of iron that grows and it grows with these um, big uh, dendrites and occasionally this big mushy layer of dendrites will fall off, stir the interior convection and can drive a dynamo. Um, so this again is sort of a, more of an overview on this sort of iron snow model um, in terms of this is the sketch here again um, and then here's sort of a buff sketch of what's going on in terms of the core temperature profile in blue and then the liquidus, so it's melting point in orange at CMB. Um, they first cross the CMB, so we start to get crystallization there. In the iron snow model, we've then got this big snape, stable snow zone where the iron crystals are created. They expel any sulfur, making this quite rich, sulfur rich, less um, dense, buoyant, stable snow zone. And then these dense iron crystals are going to fall out and then remelt as they come out the base of the snow zone because we've now got a case where our interior temperature is hotter than this, they remelt, generate convection and drive the dynamo. Um, and one of the key assumptions of this is this thermodynamic equilibrium of the snow zone, which is something we try and test in our experiments. However, there's a couple of issues um, where we start to think about applying this iron snow model to asteroid bodies. Um, and this is mainly due to the fact that these are even lower pressure than Ganymede. We're looking at bodies that are generally sort of less than one or two GPA in their centers. Um, and this leads to having a very, very small adiabatic temperature difference between the CMB and the interior. So you need a few degrees of um, supercooling or undercooling within that core to actually prevent the remelting um, of these iron crystals. And uh, well, that's a very relevant area of uh, deep earth trying to work out how much undercooling you need to generate an inner core and things like that. Um, so it's possible that this remounting might not happen. So in this case, we might be looking at a bit more of a model like this, where we've got these crystals forming, perhaps in some kind of snow zone, but actually now the base is not hotter um, than the melting temperature, so they're just going to keep falling. And in the iron snow model, these crystals don't help with the flow. So in the iron snow model, this would not generate a dynamo field. However, we've got this record that suggests these bodies were capable of generating a dynamo field. 
So our sort of two key research questions were, firstly, yeah, can these iron uh, crystals, as just for falling, can they modify the flow at all, or do we need the remelting? Is there a sufficient adiabatic difference across an asteroid core to actually generate a field? And then secondly, we kind of want to look at, is this assumption of thermodynamic equilibrium valid? Because it makes our modeling a lot easier. And also within that, like, are there any other sort of bits of physics that maybe the iron snow model um, is missing out on when we're thinking about top down certification asteroids, but also maybe across larger planetary bodies such as the moon and Ganymede as well. So this here is a schematic of tank setup we had. Um, it was a very small tank, it's about big. Um, at the top, we cooled it, it's about top down cooling. We had to put in this sort of, um, kind of artificial buoyant layer that wouldn't freeze to stop everything freezing off the top plate. Um, and basically stopped dendrites growing. And then in the middle, we had this um, eutectic, super eutectic iron chloride, um, ammonium chloride solution, which is a nice solution to work with. It behaves similar to iron iron sulfide, except you can crystallize at room temperature. Um, and we cooled and we looked at what happened. Um, and then this sort of here's got a sketch of the temperature profile of the tank, so sort of the ideal temperature profile of the tank. So conducted in this buoyant layer um, versus liquidous temperature. Again, ideal, there's no super cooling in here. Um, so we've managed to sort of force it to generate snow and crystals right below this buoyant layer. Um, so this is looking like top-down crystallization, which is nice. This here is then a picture of our setup. Um, so again, you can see this tank, this sort of um, dark layer at the top here. This is that buoyant eutectic layer that never crystallized. Um, we could take quite a few measurements of this, which is nice. So we could take temperature measurements by putting thermocouples in. Um, we could take compositional measurements actually of the fluid itself and um, look at sort of okay, is the sort of bulk composition of the liquid down here following the liquidus? So it is in thermodynamic equilibrium. And the other thing that we could do that's really nice was use these lasers to illuminate the plane, which we could then video and we could actually look at the convective velocities that are in there. Um, and one thing that this enabled us to do was say, okay, right, we'll do one of these runs with crystallization within here, look at the velocities we get. And then, okay, we're going to slightly alter the liquid composition within there. That means we can stop it crystallizing. We can now look at its velocity field and we can compare those two velocities and see, okay, for the same, basically the same heat flux outside the tank, does the crystallization provide us with any extra convection power? Um, so into the results. Firstly, we had sort of two regimes. This one here is the regime we wanted, which is on the right. And this was the snow regime. Um, and it's not the clearest picture because the laser diffuses everything but here we've got you can sort of see a load of little crystals in here you can sort of see a big plume coming down here uh, this is what we wanted it to do this is what it didn't want to do this is what we really like to do this tank and um, you can see here we've got dendrites growing all from the side walls and things like that um, so this is just sort of to highlight that as soon as you put some kind of solid substrate into one of these things it really wants to go up a solid substrate actually forcing this um, sort of crystallization away from the solid substrate is quite difficult this here is a video of one of these experiments um, where we've got crystallization happening and um, this is in real time. And just to orientate this like top seven centimeters of the tank. So what you've got here is the base of this buoyant layer and then the sort of top seven centimeters. So we're missing sort of the bottom half where you can see crystal satellite settling out. Um, but this is at the onset of convection. Um, and the colors here sort of brightness. So it's white, orange, you've got something reflecting. So in that case, this is the creation of these crystals and the crystallization up here. And what we can see is that we're getting crystals forming below the buoyant layer, but they're not just forming and settling out, they're forming and making these sort of plumes that then fall off and start to sort of stir up the interior. And there's a big one going there. Um, and you can also see they come down and then you can see this return flow up the middle as well in this case. We can look at this um, in terms of what the velocities look like in that experiment, um, in terms of the distribution of those different velocities. So take the whole thing, work out what the velocity field looked like, and then just basically say, okay, what do the speeds look like as a um, probability de density function? And we generally get these kind of bimodal um, distributions where you've got sort of one strong peak, in this case, for the crystal, when it's crystallizing at a few millimeters per second, plus or minus. A couple of millimeters and then these sort of peaks down here so secondary peaks which you think is to do with sort of a bit of shear on the side walls and sort of the insides of some of those vortices that we saw um, but this sort of high fast peak here is the one that's most relevant and representative of the flow there's something else going on down here 
Um, so as I said, we did this and then we compared it to ones, uh, cases where we didn't have any crystallization in the tank, we just had thermal convection for the same heat flux at the top. Um, so in this case, this blue histogram now put on was the same experiment, same top cold plate temperature of minus 15 degrees C, we've now not got any crystallization. And what we see here is that overall our velocities are lower in the thermal convection compared to the crystallizing case, same heat flux. So actually the presence of these crystals within those plumes is generating some extra buoyancy and some extra convective power. And this isn't something that have really been sort of thought about before. We took this and we repeated it for a load of different driving temperatures, a load of different um, CMB heat fluxes to have a look and see okay, how consistent is this as a picture. Um, and we sort of come up with this quite noisy plot, um, but we'll go through it. So on the bottom here, we've got driving temperature difference. So I've not done this in terms of a Rayleigh number because the Rayleigh number will actually get modified whether you've got crystals or not. I've left it as this driving temperature difference between the um, cold plate and the interior. So this here is this minus 15 one over 35 degrees. Um, and then we've got sort of the log um, of these speeds where the dots are the mean of that distribution and then the error bar is actually the spread of it. So it's not an uncertainty, it's what that looks like. Um, the ones that we were saying was the most representative of the flow are these fast ones, which are these circles. And then there's a bit more spread and a bit more variability in what's going on with the sort of slower peaks that we're not um, so sure representing the flow. But what we're generally seeing here is an increase during um, crystallization compared to thermal convection. Um, so the crystals do seem to be able to produce some extra convective power, even though they're not necessarily remelting. Um, we also uh, were looking at whether we, um, what happens to temperature in the composition. Um, so here we've got a case of three example runs um, where we've got um, plotted onto the phase diagrams, we've got concentration of the bulk solution that's convecting compared to its temperature. So for instance, this dark red one here started up at bulk um, solution about to 27 and a half weight percent. And after eight hours ended up down here at 25 um, and a half, starts off at temperatures of 22 down to about sort of 15 degrees C. And we can see that for all these three different ones, so the red and the orange with the snowing regime, um, and the blues is dendrite regime. So we're trying to see the difference between those two. It's not really, but we can see in all cases, we've got some kind of undercooling, some sort of kinetic hindrance here. That means we're not lying along this phase diagram. Um, the bulk is also becoming more water rich with time, which is not something iron snow would predict. Iron snow would predict that, okay, we produce this uh, light element at the top and it's going to escape and then it's going to stay up there. And um, we also never saw stable snow zone forming. And the difference between the iron snow model and our experiments is probably something to do with the morphology of the crystals that are forming. Um, they're dendritic, they're going to pull that liquid down with them, it's not just going to easily escape. Um, and that's the undercooling. And then there's very little difference between the snow versus the dendrites as well. Um, so just to summarize this, um, we found that additional crystals can generate faster convective flow than just thermal convection alone. Um, we're not seeing a stable snow zone developing. We're seeing the bulk become more water rich. We need a bit of super cooling and actually forming the crystals um, away from solid substrate is quite difficult. When we go to, to briefly apply this to a model of asteroid core crystallization, we're not going to worry about this one because um, that's just a, another question about how you form solids um, and we're not going to worry about that one just to keep the maths a bit simpler. Instead we have this now sort of possible mode of core crystallization in asteroids where we're instead of forming a snow, we're still going to have a snow zone at the top but it might not be stable. Um, instead that snow zone can delaminate if the crystal fracture gets high enough and increase the density of the fluid, fall down and start to generate convection. Um, and then, so that might drive convection, it might drive magnetic fields. And then finally, we might grow an inner core um, by settling iron crystals out if we've not got the ability to melt them um, and if the settling is quick enough. In terms of just taking that and trying to map it onto something about magnetic field strength, um, I've done a bit looking at, okay, can we estimate a Reynolds magnetic Reynolds number based off the buoyancy fluxes we get from this model? Um, so in this case, this speed in here is going to be a product of, um, a function of the buoyancy flux. So how quickly are you crystallizing? What are you crystallizing in terms of density difference between this crystal rich versus crystal poor liquid? And also um, in this case, a bit about some sort of nominal rotation rate times the length scale of convection, which we take to be the core divided by the magnetic diffusivity. And what we find in this case, um, so this here is a regime map of this, where on the x-axis we've got the CMB heat flux, so that's what's forcing your um, <coughs> crystallization. 
Uh, here you've got the core radius, so bigger cores, you can more easily get a higher magnetic profiles number. Um, if it's gray, no dynamo is possible. The white contours, we've got 10, 30, and 100, are different values of critical uh, magnetic Reynolds numbers that have been proposed. Uh, actually, the black um, dashed contours up here are for thermal convection alone, for one of these scaling laws. Um, but what we find is that based on the estimates of the buoyancy flux we get from a model like this, you could have um, dynamo generation in sort of 70 to sort of 80 kilometer radius cores and asteroids um, for some representative CMB heat fluxes. So this is looking like a possible mechanism. Um, there's a couple of caveats that we might have identified that we haven't thought about before. Um, and one is to do with crystal size. So if you've got small crystals so in the y-axis here, um, they're small, they can stay entrained in that flow. They can act as a bulk, um, so they can increase the bulk density of the fluid and they can act as extra convective power. As they start to get big, bigger, not as to be entrained, they're going to fall quicker than the plumes might fall. Um, so in this sort of regime here would need remelting to get any kind of convection. Whereas up here, actually, these are now so big, so these sort of meter size, that they're more likely to fall and stir up as a dendrite would. Um, and then the final sort of bit, and it's more to the question to the wider community, is what actually prevents iron, iron crystals from growing off the core mountain boundary. We had a real difficulty <coughs> with this in the tank. We needed that buoyant layer in there. Even we had it in there, as soon as there was a solid, it liked to form dendrites off that. Um, so, yeah, we've sort of gone with the iron snow model, but it'd be interesting to say, okay, what's, what's actually causing the difference between something forming like this versus actually forming an iron crust and dendritic layer that grows off. Um, but yeah, to conclude, we've got these experiments that possibly identify a new mode of inward course crystallization. Um, however, we've also used them to identify some other factors that might be relevant to think about when thinking about inward course crystallization. Thank you for listening. Questions? Any questions on that? Questions? Just a, just a general one, really. So the yeah. calculation of the magnetic levels and yeah. so that depends on the magnetic conductivity, yeah. which depends on the electrical conductivity, <laughs> which depends on the composition. So what are you doing? <laughs> um, so if it's pure iron, we value one point three meters per second squared, which I think is on the low end, possibly. Um, but I know there is more variability in it. It's not a yeah, it's not an answer. But you, you need a lighter constituent in there, right? Some variable, so yeah. Would that suppress it in such a way as to make it a difference to the scaling? I'm not sure. It's not something really explored. Um, actually, changing that magnetic diffusivity is something that came up on my Viber with you. Um, so yeah, it would be good to because it would increase, decrease your conductivity, so it would make that number bigger. So yeah, it definitely should be something we should probably explore because um, we have had, yeah, sort of tendency just to perform from 1.3 in there and sort of leave it as that. Um, but there's also quite a large uncertainty like what is the length scale of your convection? That's another thing that we generally take and call radius, but actually it's probably a much smaller flow than that. Um, and then should we be using 10? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, a follow up to that. Can yeah. you get the length scale convection from your analog terms? Yes, we can. But so I could get them this. The main difference, I think, that would really modify the length scale convection within here compared to rotating planet is that rotational forces. Um, so, exactly how you scale like a length scale of convection from here, you could definitely measure that reasonably easy in terms of like the vortices and things like that and that's something the software gives out its vortices it's a really nice bit of software um but i think you then have to be able to then take it further and say okay what happens if we now start rotating it and bringing in the coriolis force questions yeah. questions yeah. 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 yeah.